Hey folks, my name is Tom Vassell. Welcome to Crowd Surfing, a show in which we talk about Kickstarter projects. Now, one of the things I want to talk about when we I put this show together, I'm constantly going and looking up Kickstarter projects, but I try to do it on my own. So if you have a project you're like, please feature it on my Kickstarter show, you emailing me isn't really going to change whether I put it on or not. I'm just looking for the ones that I find the most fascinating. Speaking of which, let's take a look at some projects. Okay, so first of all, we're going to take a look here at Carthage. Carthage is, it says, easy to learn, easy to die. It's a mix of a deck builder game, um, but also a board game. Uh, I really like the graphic design on the web page itself. I'm showing how the game works. I kind of went in like, eh, I don't know. But when I came out of it, I was actually pretty interesting. Each player has unique starting hands. It just, it, the whole project looks good. It is a first time project, so it could look better than it is, but we'll have to wait and see. Role player, monsters and minions. I love role player. I'm thrilled to see an expansion, as is obviously many other people, since this one's doing really well. Uh, really well. Uh, guy has a lot of good reviews already, uh, but of course, the many, many reviews for the base game help it out. But anyway, it adds more minions and things that you can go fight. Is it? I'm, I'm kind of curious in that, because the thing I liked about role player was you gear up to fight, you build up all your stuff, and that's the game. Then actually fighting, we'll have to wait and see. But there's also just more stuff, and I'm always happy with that. Saloon Tycoon Ranch Expansion. Wasn't a huge fan of Saloon Tycoon, but it is a very nice game, pretty looking game, well put together game. Not my style, but this one adds more tiles, more stuff, people like that also with lots of horses and cows and that sort of thing. Manhattan Project 2. Now this is kind of interesting because we have Manhattan Project, we have expansions for Manhattan Project. We had Energy Empire, which is like set in the world of Manhattan Project, and this is actually a sequel. It's a standalone game. It looks like the original game, but I'm not really sure how different it is. Um, it has laborers, politicians, general spies, subs. You're trying to control third world nations. I don't know, I hope that it's good. I mean, really, Minion Games, anything with Manhattan Project on it, has done pretty well for them, and I like all of it, except I didn't like the card game. I thought that was pretty bad. Um, but I'm just gonna assume this one is good. Dream Keepers Skirmish Shadow Wars of Andaruna. Um, this is a card combat two-player game. They're talking about eventually having it be augmented reality, where I guess you look on the phone and see this stuff. The, the, the cartoon characters look cool, but I don't know, these two-player skirmish games, there is a lot of them out there. It's based on the Dream Keepers graphic novel series, but say you don't need to know anything about that series to play it, which is good, because I don't know anything about that series. Uh, Flow of History. This is a game uh, that's deluxified. Speaking of which, did you know that Trace, Tasty Minstrel, the, the word deluxified is trademarked? I found that interesting. First of all, I kind of like, I, I hate when people try to trademark a word. But this is a word that no one else uses anyway, so I don't think it matters. <laughs> uh, I do like their deluxified games. But anyway, this card game here, the graphic design looks really good. A quick card game about history, um, but this one just a much better version. And the original one actually looked pretty good. Then we have Kokora, Avenue of the Kodama. This is basically the same game as Avenue. Now, Z Garcia did a review on Avenue near the end of 2016 and really liked it. It's from Aporta Games. I don't even know why I haven't played Avenue yet, honestly, because I think pretty much everything a Porta Games does is fantastic. I like their last drawing game. This one looks better. And of course, they put this in the world of Kodama, the beautiful uh, graphic design on top of this. So this is a really cool looking game. I will certainly try to play that. My pick of the week here is Flick Wars. This is a tabletop dexterity combat game with 3D train. Now, you guys know I'm a big fan of flicking games. But I'll tell you, when I first went to this page, I looked at it and I said, eh, I don't know. Then I saw how the terrain worked, and it's a big mat, and you put stuff on top of the terrain and underneath the terrain. So you actually have this rolling hill-style terrain, and then you're flicking stuff, and it's going all over the terrain and has different abilities. And at first I thought maybe it's too complex, but the more I looked at it, the more it looks like this is kind of like a miniatures game for dexterity, as opposed to... Um, like the, the, the catacombs being the dungeon crawl. And if that's the case, I'm very pumped about it. Sign Tempore, I think that's how you pronounce it, is a cooperative miniatures game that's really blowing it up. I was like, wow, why are so many people backing this? Oh, miniatures. This is the second game 
as no of Nova Atis. This that was a fantasy game. Apparently, this is the same system. This one's sci-fi. I don't know. These games are there's starting to be a ton of them now. I'm not sure uh, if people are backing this because of the miniatures or backing it because of the game. The original game also did really well on Kickstarter. I guess we'll have to wait for a lot of reviews to come out for it. Eh, I don't know about this one myself. Ursa Minor. This one I wanted to just put on because I love the name of it, right? Ursa Minor, and it's about bears mining honey. But it also looks good. The graphic design and the, and the art is really good, and it's kind of nice to see these kind of games, you know, after looking at all these miniature games. Here's one. It's a tile laying game, hexagon tile, and you're putting bears out. It looks kind of like a Carcassonne-style thing. I have high hopes for it but I'm really just going off the name and watch a little bit of gameplay. I hope it's good. Daimyo's Fall. This is a treasure hunting deck building game, a deck building game in which you are, you can have duels with other people. You can sell the cards back um, out of your deck. So that's kind of an intriguing thing. I'm not a big fan. It just looks, and this might be a personal preference, just looks very anime. Daimyo sounds really cool. And then I look at it and it's like, oh, if you hadn't said the word daimyo, I wouldn't even know that there was any samurai stuff type in this game. It just looks like another anime cartoon put into a deck building game. That doesn't mean it's bad, but I honestly thought this was Japanime when I first looked at it, and it's not, the, the company. Fruity de Mer, this is a strategically delicious board game. Well, ching, I'm right there. I'm going to look at it. A board that looks like spaghetti with different pieces moving around on the board. A very odd board game with a really kind of horrifying picture. Look at this picture. That just kind of... <laughs> anyway, okay, but the game itself looks like an abstract game. Now, Robert, in one of our previous episodes, talked about this game and really enjoyed it, said it was kind of like a war game secret, a secret war game, like it's a war game, but you don't realize you're playing a war game. So I'm kind of intrigued. I like the spaghetti-type background, and I'm always a big fan of food themes. Mr. B Games has a game coming out called Aviation Tycoon. This is from Ted Cheatham. Now, you might not know who Ted Cheatham is, but a decade ago, he was one of the biggest game critics in the industry, was even on a Dice Tower of a few times talking about games, took a bit of a sabbatical for a while. He's back with this game, which looks like a cross between, well, they even describe it as a cross between Ticket to Ride and Acquire. Now, I thought the cross between Ticket to Ride and Acquire was Union Pacific, which is now Airlines Europe. And here we have Aviation Tycoon. But I'm going to guess it's different because I know Sean Brown from Mr. B Games has played Airlines Europe, so this has to be a different style game. Mr. B Games is usually not so good graphically for me, and this game is not like blowing my socks off graphic-wise, but the idea of it's very fascinating, and I hope it does well. And then this one I just put in here because I love the idea of this one, a dice jail. I've always made a dice drawer. That's where dice go when they're bad. You get stuck, and I call it the dice jail. I'm going to get one of these. Uh, dice jail, like you see a D, someone stepping on a D4 or whatever, you know, that you have stepped on you, you're going to jail. But if your dice are rolling poorly, it's silly. I'm not superstitious about dice at all, but I thought this was a really funny idea, a dice jail. All right, let's keep going on with the oh, show. Oh, hey, what's funding? Just time for a quick look at a game that's currently crowdfunding, and today we're looking at Deep Space D6. So here we're taking a look at Deep Space D6, a space solitaire game where you're going to be protecting your crew and ship from internal and external threats. The first thing you're going to do in turn is roll all of your crew dice. Any dice showing this symbol here get placed up here, and if you ever have three, such as we do now, you draw out a new threat and place it out. Afterwards, you're going to assign your crew dice to various locations such as firing weapons, recharging shields, repairing hull, things like that. For example, I could assign this one here and do one point of damage to this Corsair, sliding it down. And you can assign that damage any way you wish. You also have threats that require you to assign dice to them to activate them. So if I'd had an additional one, I could put it here. And if I had another, I could eliminate the threat or I could wait till the next round. Once you've assigned all of the dice that you're going to do, and taking your actions, the next thing you do is draw a new threat card and place it into its associated spot. From there, we're going to roll the threat die and see if anything activates. In the case of this, we rolled a four, so this bomber here would activate. Now, this does negative one hull, and we send a unit to the infirmary. In addition, the invaders and the corsair would also activate. After that, you gather up all your available dice, roll them again, and play again. If at any point you get through the entire 
entire deck, removing all threats, then you have won. If, on the other hand, at any point your hull hits zero, then you have lost. So let's look at Deep Space D6. Now, this is a second printing for the Kickstarter. It did kickstart originally back in, I believe, 2015 successfully, but the new version does have some upgrades and expansions, so it might be worth taking a look even if you already own the first edition. The game itself is a solitaire game, so as such, it may not be for everyone. Now, there is a lot of randomness and luck in this game. There's dice and cards. It's unavoidable, but I never felt restricted by it. You get to make choices, and there's a bit of a press your luck in making those decisions about which ships to take out, which threats to deal with. The game also does come with some other ship boards that allow more meaningful decisions in terms of what your crew dice can do and things like that. Overall, I really enjoy this game for a solo experience, for something you can just take out of the box and start playing. I hope this is giving you an idea whether this game might be something you want to take a look for at, and if so, head over to their Kickstarter page, and I look forward to seeing you guys next episode. Hello chaps and chapits! Would you like to see a brand new game which is fresh from France? Well, here... Sorry? It's not breakfast time. That means it's crowd surfing time! Ow! Clash of Rage is an area control combat game for two to four players. Players will be playing leaders of clans, and all their clans have been kicked off of their land by those pesky goody two-shoes elves. So the best strategy is all the leaders have decided to attack the elves at the same time. The game is a very simple, easy game to learn, and is played over a number of rounds made up of five phases. The first phase, the elves get stronger. You will equip the elves with random items, which will make them stronger. Phase two, players will be choosing initiative cards. These cards determine the turn order, as well as give you resources like money and army units. Phase three will see players taking one action. They will either move their armies or equip their armies. If you move your armies, you're gonna be trying to take control of the cities, which will give you a victory point. And also the forges, which will give you the ability to construct legendary weapons, which will also give you a victory point. If your units encounter the elves or another player's clan, there will be combat. Combat is dice driven, but it's not the number of units that you have in the space, it's what you do with those units. Equipped in your armies means that you'll be buying items from the black market and making each of your units stronger. You'll also be able to buy a special hero which will help you out in combat, and it will be then that you'll be able to use the crystals that you've collected with the forge to create those legendary weapons. Phase four will see reinforcements emerge from the reinforcement stones. And phase five will see you taking another action, whether it be moving or purchasing. If at any time in phase five, one player has four points from the cities they are in control of and the legendary weapons they have, they win the game. So if that all sounds interesting to you, then maybe you wanna go and check out Clash of Rage on Kickstarter right now. Now. Yeah, now. Not in a minute. Now. Oh. Are you still there? Hey folks, today we're gonna, I want to talk a little bit quickly about funding. There's two fu things that I, as a consumer, find really irritating about funding. Maybe you don't, and if you don't, tell me in the comments, you know, or let's, let's agree or disagree. But one is when you set the funding go so low that in my opinion, it's almost insulting. When I see that you need a hundred dollars to fund your board game, then go ask mommy for a hundred dollars. Really, if you only need a hundred dollars, you're lying. You are literally lying to us. And when I come in to back a project, if I see that you have an extremely low goal, I'm out immediately. Now you might say, well, Tom, no, they don't really need that much money. What they, they need is a much more than that, but they, are, they already have the game ready to go and they're just using Kickstarter's pre-orders. No, you put in how much money you need. And this drives me nuts anyway, because there's a couple things. One, you put $100 in and then you get, you know, four or 5,000 and they're like, Wow, our Kickstarter goal made uh, over a thousand percent, four thousand percent. No, that stop, stop blowing that nonsense. But I also hate when someone gets to their goal, and then they they get there and they kind of pull out, or, or they're almost there and they pull out. They're like, we're not going to get money. I'm like, but you made your goal. 
yeah, but we wanted to get all these stretch goals. Listen, if you need those funding amounts to get your game out, then you put those in. It's the same way I always felt about eBay. When you bid on eBay, there's people who complain, they're outbid by other people, so on and so forth. Okay, so you got outbid by other people. Um, just put in your max amount. And if you get outbid, it is what it is. Now there's, there's, there's some other variations in there, but basically if I want something on eBay for $20, I bid $20 and if someone bids 21, so be it. They sniped me or whatever. I wasn't willing to pay more than that. Just put in your max bid. Same thing. If you're running a Kickstarter, put in how much you need as your goal. If you don't, you're lying to your consumers and I don't want to back a liar. Tell me how much you need. And then as a very small side note, if you fund very quickly, you can put that, I mean, a lot of these Kickstarters I talked about today did that. Fund it in three hours, fund it in 18 hours. I don't care. As a consumer, I don't care how fast you fund it. And you're like making, taking up room on the Kickstarter. I want to actually see what's going on in the Kickstarter. I want to learn about your game. I don't care how fast you kickstart it. I don't need to jump on the bandwagon. I want to see if it's a good game or not. Anyway, that's what I thought. Funding goals, tell us what you need so we can help you. Stonemeyer Games, and today I'm going to talk about the hidden job of every Kickstarter creator. This is one of those things that I talk about when I say that when you are launching a Kickstarter campaign or thinking about it, you are not just a game designer anymore, you are also a business owner. And the number one thing that you do as a business owner, especially with Kickstarter, is project manage. And what that specifically means is that you are coordinating with a lot of different people to do a lot of different things unless you are the rare person that can do everything. If maybe you are a, well, actually I'll, I'll list all the things and if maybe you are this person. Um, I have business partners, I have investors, advisors, I have artists, I have graphic designers, game designers, lawyers, accountants, web app developers, game developers, manufacturers, play testers, local and blind, video editors, Kickstarter page proofreaders, advertisers, backers, of course, Kickstarter backers, Facebook fans, Proofreaders, international production partners, freight shippers, fulfillment centers, distributors, retailers, replacement part helpers, bloggers, podcasters, reviewers, and contacts at conventions and convention volunteers. It's a very long list of all these different people that I'm juggling. There are three things that I'd recommend that you keep in mind if you are doing this project management element. Um, one, offer clear expectations to your partners up front. When you ask them to do something for you, tell them very clearly what it is and when you need it done by. Two, compensate them in a fair way. Um, some of these people are volunteers, but many of them are paid and all of them are compensated in some way, whether it's a free game, a discount on a game or an actual payment. Um, also, uh, I like to do most everything over email because it gives me a way to go back and search things that I said yesterday or a week or a month ago. This is obvious to you uh, probably, but for me, it's really, really helpful to be able to look up past conversations. The one exception being if there's conflict there's conflict, I try to do a Skype or a phone call so that we can hash it out in person and, and express ourselves better in words. And last, uh, there are three platforms I'd recommend you use for project management. One is called Basecamp, one is called Slack, and kind of a universal one is Google Docs. I use Google Docs for a ton of this stuff and it actually is really, really helpful. So those are all the, well, a broad overview of project management. I'd recommend you read the entry, The Hidden Job of, of Every Kickstarter Creator on my Kickstarter Lessons blog. Thanks. Hey everyone, I'm Mandy. Hi guys, I'm Carol. And today we're gonna to take a look at some kick sitters that we think need a little love or heck, we just love. So Carol, why don't you tell me what you have on your list today? So this week's pick is because I love Warhammer Quest, the adventure card game, and two of the three designers behind that great card game has launched a Kickstarter project for a new game called Street Masters, Rise of the Kingdom. Street Masters plays cooperatively for one of four players in a beat-em-up miniature-style board game with an arcade mode to customize fighters, bosses, and stages, as well as a story mode that campaigns for progress with perks or penalties depending on if you succeeded or not. What drew me to the game were the instant callbacks to the old 80s or 90s fighting video games like Double Dragon or Street Fighter, as well as the replayability of having different fighters and their unique decks to choose from for different fighting styles. I'm really looking forward to this one. So this hits a few points. It has replayability and it hits on that whole nostalgia note with the whole Street Fighter. Oh my gosh, I used to love that. <laughs> Not to mention miniatures for me. Of course, your favorite. <laughs> <laughs> so what's your pick for this week, Mandy? 
So you all know how I love food, and really any type of food. <laughs> Kitchen Rush is a game of my choice, which is by David Tursi, creator of Anachrony, and is published by Artipia. So Kitchen Rush simulates a high-pressured kitchen environment through real-time worker placement. One to four players work together trying to fulfill orders fast enough to earn money to keep the business going across four rounds of four minutes. In the game, players use hourglasses as their workers, assigning them to various tasks from taking orders, cooking dishes, and buying groceries. Any worker placed in an action space may not be used elsewhere before the sand within the hourglass runs out, making each decision important. My goodness, it's so much stress in this game, but I'm like, oh my gosh, it's food, stress. Ah, like, I can't help it. I just want to like, oh, it looks so fun. And I'm not usually into these types of games, but it seems interesting. And the whole mechanism with the hourglass, I don't know, it's a bit different. What do you it think? definitely reminds me of Diner Dash, actually. Have you ever played that app? I have. Exactly, where all the different stations are ready at a certain time, and then you have to flip it over, and you have to get that, do that. I, I, uh, I'm stressed already <laughs> thinking about it. And maybe it just has to simulate like a real time, like a real thing. It just... Yeah, there's a physical timer, yeah. <laughs> I'm exactly. stressed right now. <laughs> I'm all about the visuals, all about the visuals. So our choices this week are Kitchen Rush, and Street Masters Rise of the Kingdom. Go check them out on Kickstarter. That's it for this week, and we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye. Hey friends, Chubby Meeple here back for another exciting segment of crowdfunding. And today I want to talk about a game that I got to pre play a don't even really want to call it a prototype. It was very much a placeholder uh, version of a game. No artwork whatsoever. Uh, but that game is called Under League. Um, this is a game where you are kind of fighting in a seedy underbelly of a futuristic city. You've got a stable of monsters that are your creatures that are fighting against the other players' creatures. Um, very much in kind of a Magic the Gathering kind of feel, your, your monsters are battling it out. However, the difference in this game is when you're battling the monsters, you're not necessarily trying to kill the other monsters because they don't really die. They just get exhausted for the round and then revive for the next fight. But what's really important is betting on which monsters you think are going to win which fights. Um, every player has given five betting cubes and, or, or betting chips. Um, says win on one side, lose on the other, and you place all five of your betting chips before any combat actually happens. And then based on successfully betting, that's going to determine how many strategy cards you're able to draw from the strategy deck, which gives you equipment that can boost your creatures up. Uh, it also um, it can play scheme cards that let you get rid of other things um, or you know exhaust other creatures from other players, all kinds of different things that can happen. And you play until uh, someone uh, has a value of of 20 points or more um, by either the value of the the total value of their monsters plus victory cards they've uh, accrued from winning these battles. Um, then the first player to 20 wins. If someone happened, you have a couple players happen to get to 20, then whoever has the most points wins. Uh, very cool game. Uh, the final artwork is fantastic. Again, the version I played um, had no artwork whatsoever on it. It was literally just a placeholder to give you a feel for the game, but the final artwork looks absolutely stunningly gorgeous. Definitely check it out on Kickstarter. The game again is called Under league um, that's all one word uh, check it out on kickstarter they could really use some love they've got probably another week and a half or two weeks left on the campaign here uh, so hopefully they can get funded and get this game out in the wild because it is absolutely a gorgeous game and the aspect of having to bet on these battles as opposed to just attack versus defense like uh, your standard card battling games are as a really unique twist and, and you know there can be some strategy in betting on your own creatures to lose so uh, again that's under league check it out on kickstarter and until next time i'm the chubby meeple saying keep gaming friends and that's it for another crowd surfing episode folks thanks for watching thank you to jamie and our other contributors for sending things in uh come back in two weeks we'll talk about some more kickstarters i hope you enjoyed it i hope you check out some of these kickstarters see if they interest you until next time i'm tom vassal and this has been crowd surfing